everybody to American Jewish University's MAVEN platform. It's great to see everybody, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful, wonderful uh, interview with two of my new best friends. Uh, <laughs> Helene Stepanski is the nationally best-selling author of three memoirs, Five Finger Discount, Murder in Matera, and Baby Plays Around. She writes regularly for the New York Times, appears in the Washington Post, New York Magazine, Travel and Leisure, and dozens of other publications. She teaches writing at NYU and lives in Brooklyn, New York. Bonnie Siegler is the founder and creative director of award-winning multidisciplinary graphic design studio, Eight and a Half, author of Dear Client, a guide for people who work with creatives, and Signs of Resistance, A History of Protest in America. She has taught design at Yale and the School of Visual Arts for many years, and Bonnie lives in Connecticut. And these two women have written the most amazing, wonderful book. I love this book. It's called The American Way, The True Story of Nazi Escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe. You know what I found, Helene and Bonnie? This is a story of immigrants and survivors, of escape and tragedy, of families and communities, of love and loss, of movies and mobsters, and of superheroes both real and imagined. And it all begins, Bonnie, with your family story, a tall tale told by your grandfather, Jules Schulbach, who somehow captured a whole movie of one of the most famous scenes in film history. Marilyn Monroe, standing above a subway grate in New York City, her dress billowing up over her head. Tell us about that. Well, my grandfather shot film often. He had a 16 millimeter movie camera that he loved. And because of his experience getting out of Germany and losing so many family members, he really felt it was important to capture everyday moments. So he always had his camera and appreciate everyday moments. And then he, on his block, they were filming the day scenes from Seven Year Itch. He befriended someone and they said, oh, you should come by tomorrow night because we're shooting you know, tomorrow night at like 1 a.m. So we <laughs> went out with this movie camera and he basically was standing right behind the camera, right behind Billy Wilder. Wow. And there were movie lights. So you know, home movies are often problematic because no, there's no lighting, but he had movie lights. So he was really close to her and he just, filmed. It's, it is incredible footage. The scene in the book is amazing, the way you describe it. Uh, hundreds of men, mostly, late at night, trying to grab a glimpse of this fabulous movie star. She was already quite famous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure they knew what was going to happen with that dress, but boy, oh boy, that was something else. <laughs> Helene, how did this story come to you? Well, Bonnie um, had had the footage. She had found the footage of um, Marilyn Monroe. She'd held on to it for a while, about mm -hmm. almost like a decade. And then when things started to get uh, kind of heat up with the anti-Semitism again that we're sort of experiencing now, um, mm -hmm. not that it's ever gone away, but when things started to get bad again, um, she wanted to get her grandfather's story out there about him escaping Nazi Germany. And, and also just through. reminding people what happened right. at this moment in time. That was really yes. the point. Like, remember what happens when we hate others? This is what happens. <laughs> right. So the, the footage was really the, the way in, you know, she said, oh, I have this footage that my grandfather shot. You know, she was told a friend that she wanted someone to write a story about it, uh, about not just the footage, but her grandfather's story of escape. And so um, the friend said, oh, I know just the person. She put us together and we met and I looked at the footage on, um, <laughs> on Bonnie's phone you know just tiny little thing but it was amazing you know blew my mind and then she told me the story about her grandfather and his escape and that was more amazing than the footage and uh so I wrote a story for the times I interviewed Bonnie I interviewed a bunch of other people uh the story ran in the times in 2017 and it went viral it was one of those stories that just went around the world and back again and um you can see a little bit of the footage on in that clip if you look online from at the New York Times um, and then a couple of years went by. And in the meantime, Bonnie found out that um, her 
grandfather's financial sponsor to come to America was the publisher of Superman. Wow. And so we didn't have that element when I wrote the story, but then she, so she had that. And so she's like, why don't we write a book about my grandfather? <laughs> and I was like, yes, please. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of like a perfect blind date when we met. Exactly. <laughs> because it was just like, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's what's really interesting is that the two of you kind of clicked over this story and and then began a whole process of research. I mean, how how many years have you worked on this book? Well, the the I would say we basically did it during COVID. We ah. talked about it in January of 2020, and then we started it right away and then worked for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, you've already mentioned this, that the early chapters in the book describe Berlin, Germany of the 1930s, uh, which on the one hand was the great thriving center of culture and commerce and a very sophisticated and successful Jewish community. Yep. But this guy Hitler came to power and with his anti-Semitic rhetoric that morphed into violence against the Jews, everything started to change. And here we get scenes of the Schulbach extended family sort of debating the difficult decision, should we stay or should we go? Well, the, and those who got out, right? Uh, uh, and there were those who refused that things could get worse. The older people felt like, especially my great grandparents, they were established, they owned a business, they were prominent in the Jewish community. They're not gonna bother them. They have money. They weren't going to be fine. They had fought in World War I. You know, they were veterans of World War I. They fought for Germany. You know, they yeah. couldn't imagine that that would happen to them. And, um, you know, part of the problem was that they were successful and, and well established in the community. Hitler used that against them. He said the Jews are trying to take over, you know, and that's how it all. Happened. Yeah, Jews will not replace us. It's yeah, exactly familiar. right. You know, yeah, what we I have mean? to hear that again, you know. You know, that's why I think the book certainly resonates with people today and the things that we're experiencing here. That's in this why book. we wrote it. <laughs> that's, that's the point. Um, but the, the reason we liked going through that period in Berlin was to show there were 400 laws passed between 33 and 38 restricting the movement, ownership, everything for Jews, and that it happened so slowly over time, like the frog in the boiling water, like you just didn't know where it was going and you always thought well this i can handle and then the next thing would hit yeah uh, this really resonates uh because i know that uh friends of mine uh have had that kind of conversation in the last couple of years oh definitely um, there's there's a nathan englander book called what we talk about when we talk about anne frank and in it is that every jew should know who would hide them today that you reach out and figure out where would you go if need be yeah it's, chills. yeah i know it's kind of scary but but um i was just amazed at these chapters where you describe the ongoing development of the it got worse and worse and worse and it's you know, it's not a new story. We know this from history books and so on. But one of the things that's very powerful about your book is when you focus on one family and their story, it personalizes the experience. You really feel it. And it's written so beautifully in the details that you were able to uncover, uh, putting people in the room where it happened uh, with all of the, all of the, um, beautiful descriptions of people's apartments and, and their, their objects and so on. It's just heartbreaking as the story starts to unfold. Now, now your grandfather, Bonnie Jules, uh, was one of those who thought, I got to get out of here. Uh, so he books himself a ticket to America to find a fiscal sponsor. You had to have a sponsor, right? Correct. And what was the thinking about that from the American side of things? You mean, how did Americans feel about? Yeah, I mean, why did they insist that you had to have a fiscal sponsor when you were trying to get out of Europe? Oh, it was horrible. I mean, the laws were prevented people from coming. Everyone knows about the St. Louis. Yes. I mean, so um, 
Yeah, so you needed work. somebody, you needed somebody to kind of vouch for you. Yeah, and it had to be somebody with enough with a some amount of money, just uh -huh. enough money in their bank account so that if this immigrant needed help, couldn't, you know, support themselves, this person would step in. But but obviously that never happened. <laughs> my my grandfather never told us about Harry Donenfeld. And Harry was the guy they found to be the sponsor? Yes, he was the next door neighbor of a cousin of my grandfather's who happened to already be in New York. Yeah, he lived in the Bronx next door to this woman named Faye. And Faye had stayed friends with Harry over the years. And Harry got richer and richer. He was a bootlegger. Uh, he was a publisher of girly pulp magazines. And then just around the time that Jules came to America to get a sponsor, he published, it was the same week that Jules came to America, he published Superman. And so he went yeah. from rich to very Super rich. rich. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's another part of the wonderful story here is that, that Donenfeld, who is a very colorful character, he had mob connections as well, as I recall. Absolutely, yeah. He, he was a bootlegger, so you had to have mob connections if you were a bootlegger. Wow. He was friends wow. with Frank Costello, you know, who's a big- Oh, Frank Costello was yeah, big. well, yeah, absolutely. They were buddies. So because he published these girly magazines, he was in the kind of distribution business. Is that yeah. how he got into the comics? Yes, exactly. exactly. His comics, really, comic books were really new at the time. Totally right? new, yeah. And yeah. he had, had no idea they were going to be as big as they were. You know, it was just a another venture. You know, he did all kinds of stuff to make money. And that one he paid got, off. And he got in trouble with the law a lot because of the girly magazines. I mean, by today's standards, they're drawings of girls. But then yeah. it got him- Close to pornography, out. really, really. Yeah, it was. I mean, that's what they considered. Pretty, and and because funny. it traveled through the U.S. mail, that's where they got him. But he also responded positively to Faye's invitation to sponsor this guy who was, he didn't know. He was a man. He was a Jew. He was a Jew. He said, <laughs> yeah. you know what? We're going to help him get out of Europe because the news had already started to hit uh, in America what was going on, certainly. Um, as we got closer to 1940, this was, I think, 1938 or so. And right. yeah, I think most people who were in a position to help like that did, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, anybody who had some money who was Jewish or, you know, friend to Jewish people stepped in and, and tried to bring people over. I think, I think that was pretty typical. Right. And Donenfeld, Harry Donenfeld, besides being a, the publisher of Superman, you, you tell a very interesting tale that a lot of people don't know about these two young guys from Cleveland, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, who had created Superman, an immigrant from Krypton, whose given name was Kal El, which in Hebrew means the voice of God, one of the most famous uh, immigrants to uh, certainly the United <laughs> States. <laughs> Absolutely. And one of the most famous, I mean, he really created the superhero genre. Yeah. yeah. So what, what's that story? How did, how did the Sch Schuster and Siegel find Harry Donenfeld? And what did Harry Donenfeld do with this creation of theirs? Well, Jerry and Joe had been chopping Superman around for about five years, unsuccessfully. People said, it's just like, you know, the story of Harry Potter. 25 publishers rejected Harry Potter. <laughs> right. So they went to every company, everyone rejected it, told them the drawing was too crude, the writing was too simple. You know, they had lots of criticism. Yeah. Harry needed something for a new magazine he was putting out called Action Comics. And he called someone and said, do you have any garbage lying around that I can buy? <laughs> and they sent him Superman and he was like, fine, fine, I'll run with this. Wow. And it was not intentional in that way. And they, he paid Jerry and Joe $105 for the rights for in perpetuity for everything. Oh my God. But and I think it was 130, but it, sorry, it, that was a lot of money then. <laughs> well, that was a lot of money for what they were doing. I mean, that, you know, you look at it now, you say, oh, but they you know, were very it became, happy. It became, it became a radio happy. show, it became a, a you know, well, movie. I, and you know, you guys are authors, you know, and I published some books. So, you know, it, you get excited when a publisher of any kind says, you know, I think your work is worthy exactly. of seeing the light of day. So these two young guys probably thought, you know, and I doubt that they went to a lawyer. Correct. Uh, 
<laughs> no, <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. The most, even more humiliating for them, though, in retrospect, was they spelled both their names wrong on that check. <laughs> so they had to, or they thought they had to sign their names spelled wrong in order to get the money. <laughs> well, that's amazing. But it, it struck me that, and you make this point in the book, that that Superman is has got this kind of Jewish flavor to him that a lot of people don't realize. Not it's just a story, it's a story of Moses, really. You know, he yeah. falls to earth. He's just practically in a basket. You know, he's in this little asteroid, and a couple of goys come over and find him and adopt him. <laughs> and Superman, the the adoptive mother in the original story that Jerry and Joe wrote, her name was Mary. Oh you my gosh! Later, but it started. Oh my with Mary. gosh! <laughs> Speaking of names, you know, Superman's alter ego was. Clark Kent, and yes. Clark is a name that figures in your book uh, quite quite um, amazingly. So could you comment about that for a minute? Well, so, you, you, you tell us. <laughs> when, so he, my grandfather went to America to get a sponsor and then he had to go back to Germany to collect my grandmother and my mother. So he got, you know, he's getting off the boat, the Gestapo or the brown shirts are there and they say, you're a Jew, why are you coming back? We don't want Jews here. We're trying to get rid of all the Jews. You can't come in. And he said, how, why? I have no idea, but he said, well, I'm Clark Gable's agent. And if I don't get in, and, and he knew Clark that the Fuhrer loved Clark Gable. If I wow. don't get in, then there won't be any more Clark Gable movies coming into Germany. And they let him in. Oh my gosh. And it was Clark a little a little fib, but it worked to get him back into the country to retrieve your grandmother and and, uh, and, and another family member, a sister? Mother, his mom. Oh, your mother. Mom. My mom. It's your mom. It's on the so without book. Clark Gable, you probably wouldn't have gotten, they, they yeah, might not exactly. be here. Yeah, and Clark, Clark, Gable, Clark Kent is named not. after Clark Gable, so. There you go, there are the Clarks. It's all connected. It is all connected. <laughs> and that's one of the brilliant things about your book is that you weave these stories together so beautifully. Uh, and another one of the stories that just captured my attention was the story of your grandmother, Edith's sister, uh, Ushi, rhymes with Tushy. Exactly. Uh, who did not escape from Germany. Correct. She, she hid out. She didn't look very Jewish. So she hid out in Berlin throughout the entire war. Mm. And the name for people who, who went underground was submarines or U-boats. And wow. they, they were a community of people, basically. Yeah. yeah. And she and left. You know, she left when the war was over. She came to America. But. Right. But while she was there, she worked at the Siemens factory. You know, I just yesterday I had a, a little test. Um, uh, you know, one of these uh, MRI tests with a Siemens machine. They're still around. Right? Yeah, it, it always it always hits me right here. To I see know it makes me a little sick. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, but uh, because there was a factory in Berlin uh, that was making electronics for the bombs and other sorts of things, and you describe in the book that uh, Ushi was working there with 800 other Jewish, young Jewish women who were kind of forced into slave labor, really, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It, and, was. it was slave labor, yes. And right and before they sent, it, sent, they sent it from Berlin, then it was being bombed, so they had to move it to the concentration camps, you know. And so then it was really slave labor. They were working in the death, but Ushi got out before that. So. Ah, well, the reason it resonates with me is that my mother-in-law, Hildegard, may she rest in peace, was also in that Siemens factory. Oh, oh she lived and with she, Hildegard. It could be. <laughs> she did. She, you know, uh, my great, my mother-in-law, Hilda, used to call it the, she said, we worked in the Jewish room. Wow. Until one day, and you describe this in the book, that the, these these young Jewish women would go into the ladies' room to talk about what was happening. And, and my, Hilda, we used to tell the same story that you write in your book. I got chills, one, that's amazing. Oh that my God. One day, the rumor was that the next day or the next couple of days- They're shipping them out. They're gonna yep. ship them out. 
Mm -hmm. And the next day, 50 of 50% 50 of the young women didn't show up to work because they yeah. were afraid they'd be transported. And yeah. Hildegard and Ushi were two of those Jewish women. Wow. Yeah, I have to, f well, we'll talk later. I want to know last names and everything. Yeah. Okay. So definitely, yeah. There's a Hildegard that I was, she Hilde Hilde Well, her name was Hildegard Liebal, but isn't that something? Yeah. Now, Ushi eventually made her way to New York, at, right? As you say, uh, yeah, Helene. She met her husband on the boat coming to America. And wow. she had hit out in Berlin for the whole war as well. And you call Ushi in your book a superhero. Absolutely. And this is one of the themes in your book. She told him. Now, how was Ushi a superhero? She, the whole time she was hiding, she carried her typewriter around with her. You can oh imagine having to move from place to place all the time. You don't want to lug something heavy, but she did. She carried it all over Berlin and brought it to America. Um, but the, the, her main superhero power, though, was that she she had a friend um, whose whose testimony we watched. We watched the videotape of it. Um, her friend Leah had been. Is it Leah? Leah. Leah. Leah um, had been um, sent by train. She was being sent to a concentration camp. Um, and before she left, she went to visit her and brought her a bottle of cognac, I think, of brandy camp cognac, I can't remember. And um, knowing she could use it for a bribe at some point. Yeah. And so once she got on the train, she bribed the, the guard on the train to let her use the bathroom. And she went to the bathroom and slipped out the window and she lived and everybody on that train died. And so because of Ushi bravely bringing her this bottle of cognac, you know, she was able to, to survive. And then there were other stories once she got to America you know, she did all kinds of stuff for people. She and Jules were just amazing people in the Jewish community and they helped everybody. And was it, what's the one story? There's somebody's kid was trapped in a uh, a room. The door was locked. They accidentally locked the door and oh, she uh, climbs out on the, the ledge, the window ledge and climbs into like, the room to get the like kid. Superman, literally. Yeah. Like Superman. It's, it's Superman without a cape. It's, yeah, exactly. It's like out of that I Love Lucy episode, you know, that Superman is in. <laughs> Well, I, but I love that story because what you're pointing out is that everybody could be a superhero and you have um, very, very beautifully written about uh, the fact that some of these folks, especially Jules and Ushi and others in the story, even Harry in a way. Yes, absolutely. Even with all of his mishigas, we would call it, all his craziness, uh, was a superhero in a way because he saved Jews, he, he brought well, these people out. There, there are 23 of us in my family who wouldn't be here were it not for Harry Donald. Isn't that something? Now, another superhero in your story is Norman Jean Doherty. And Norman. you tell her story very beautifully. How is Marilyn Monroe one of your superheroes in this book? Well, she's... um. She's got several connections to the story. You know, we, we tried to tie her in as well. She, uh, first of all, obviously, um, Jules filmed her that night. So that's the main connection, right? We found out while we were researching it that she also posed for Harry's magazines, some of his girly magazines in the 40s. There's a picture of her in the book covered in the covers of the magazine she posed for in 1946. And wow. so that was the connection between let Harry and, and Marilyn. Um, but then once we started to learn about Marilyn Monroe, both of us were kind of blown away by her. And I didn't know much about her, to be honest. My generation kind of disregarded her as sort of a bubble-headed blonde. You know, we didn't really think much about her. And researching her, we realized how far ahead of her time she was. You know, she was really this feminist. She owned her own production company. I mean, women did not own their own production companies, you know, in the 50s. It just wasn't done. Um, I think Lucille Ball owned half of one. What's that? Especially starlets. Like, if you were a movie yes. star, you weren't thinking about your business. Right. They right. were giving her crappy roles as as bimbos or blondes. Yeah. And, um, and she said in response to it, well, screw this. I'm just going to start my own production company. I love the way you write this. If, if with, your, uh, with your permission, I'd like to read just a little bit from the book. Marilyn, in an era when women were not allowed to have any real desires besides home and family, was looking out for her interests. The photographers, the film directors, the studio heads, the press, the publicists, the magazine editors and publishers, all men who would claim they had helped her get to where she was going had all been working for her. Her talent, her brilliance really, was making them think that they were doing her a big favor 
and she did it all disguised as a dumb blonde. I mean, that's beautifully written. Thank Your you. book is filled with exquisite details. You see the rooms, you see the fashions, you feel the atmosphere, and a little unknown tidbit about Marilyn. She had an alias when she checked into hotels. What, do, would you tell everybody what that was? Zelda Snook. <laughs> I hope you're all laughing because when I read that, I almost fell off my chair. Zelda <laughs> Schnook was Marilyn Monroe. And then she meets Arthur Miller and they get married and she converts to Judaism. You the have that connection. story in this book. <laughs> like, tell us about that a little bit. You want to go there, Bob? No, you can. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, she, you know, she, she's this one point, point where she says she really um, sympathizes with the Jewish people because she's been you know abused her whole life and people are just you know she's been trying to make it in the, the industry but not just that she was an orphan and you know just a really hard life and people were always giving her a hard time and so she felt like she really related to the Jews and so when she married Arthur Miller you know he I guess probably asked her to convert and she did you know and she loved his family she I probably loved his family more than she loved him maybe and um her his mother was really great she taught her how to make matzo ball soup and all this stuff I think she felt that love of this Jewish family you know and um, she just she stayed a Jew you know even after she divorced him so it's kind of amazing she, I think she married him because she wanted to be Jewish <laughs> you know that's a thing right now it could you be know, we're, yeah. we're seeing that in our uh, American Jewish University Moss Center for Jewish Journeys where we have our fabulous introduction to Judaism program where people come to explore their Jewish ancestry or they're interested in becoming Jewish it's a thing right now and yeah yeah well so I'm definitely interested I mean I, I grew up Catholic and but gave that up a long time ago and um you know, meeting Bonnie, that her family accepted me into the fold, and I couldn't have written this book without them. And I just feel really welcomed by them. And I do have some Polish, um, uh, some Polish Jewish Polish um, heritage in my family, and so I'm like, hmm, you know. <laughs> well, you could you could do a DNA test and find out. No, I, I am. It's thirteen <laughs> percent. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're certainly an ally and friend of the Jewish people by yes, writing this absolutely. magnificent book with Bonnie. It's just uh, really quite extraordinary. Why did you choose the title The American Way? What What's the way that you're describing in this book? Well, The American Way is part of Superman's motto, truth, justice. Truth, justice in the American way, exactly. faster than a speeding bullet. So that's that's the origin. But the reason we liked it and chose it is because it's it's ironic. The American way is they let my family come into America in 1938. That's the American way. They saved our lives. All the other people who didn't make it, that's also the American way. Right. So we it, it captured a lot of the the nuance of what America actually was doing in the last century. Yeah, same thing with Harry Donenfeld. You know, he he saved them. You know, uh, that was the American way. He came to their their aid, but he also screwed over Jerry and Joe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. also that's the American the, way. That's the American know? way too. Exactly. Um, it's legal, yeah, you, know, you know, not ethical, but legal. We were just watching, Susie and I were just watching last night, the first episode of Rough Diamonds on uh, on Netflix. It's a story of a Antwerp-based uh, Jewish Hasidic family that that gets involved in some stuff and and one of the uh characters says to the other family is family but business is business so that i i thought of harry you know where, where he's so you know, give you the shirt off his back when it's family time right. but when it's business it's business and that's kind of a sad story actually what happens to uh, joe and jerry and their yeah. fight to try to recapture their their rights to Superman, which never really happened, although they certainly made money while they were, um, you well, know, in the height of Superman. It, right. it, I mean, they sold it in 38. The movie came out, the first movie came out in 77. Mm. They weren't acknowledged until that movie. Wow. So they did get something. They gave them a yearly st stipend, but it didn't make up for 40 years of neglect. Yes, for sure not. 
My Maven friends, if you have a question for our authors, please put it in the uh, Q&A and uh, we'll share it with everybody. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's talk about the, um, uh, the kind of concluding part of your story uh, in the book, which is to sort of bring these themes together. And could you say a few words about that, how you wanted to intertwine these stories of both um, escape and, uh, and superhero-ness and, uh, and the American way? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give too much away because I want people to read it and enjoy the surprises. Sure. But um, towards the end of his life, well, not the end of his life, um, when he was in his 50s, Jules's wife, Edith, uh, um, Bonnie's grandmother, had a stroke. And they told Jules that she would only live a few days or a few weeks. She wasn't going to make it. And he said, well, then I'm going to take her home because I want to be with her in those last moments. So he brings her home and she lives for like 25 years because he takes care of her so well. Wow. You know? And so he was this amazing guy and not just to her, but to the whole community. Like he was the guy who you called if you fell off a stepladder and needed somebody to come and pick you up. You know, he was the guy who would bring you to the doctor if you needed to go. He was the guy who would call and remind you to take your pills. You know, he was the guy who was on the block watch association. He was the mayor of the block. Um, so he was this just great, great guy. And so um, there's this moment in the book where, you know, he's giving a speech about his escape from Nazi Germany. He'd like to tell the story all the time. That's how Bonnie knew it. And um, and he talks about how we're all connected and we have to love each other, you know, and that in the end is the message of the book. It's not hate. It's love. You know, you have to take care of each other no matter what you are, Jewish, non-Jewish, black, white, Chinese, whatever. We've got to take care of each other. You know, what's stop. Stop what you're doing, you know. And so that's how it all kind of ties together, I think. That's that's lovely, Bonnie. You called your grandfather Opie, uh, and some uh, German families would call a grandfather Opa and yes. and Oma for grandmother. Could you tell us, uh, you know, some of your other memories uh, about um, your grandfather, your Opie? It's so funny. I I I mean, I just I thought they were the only Omi and Opie. Um, <laughs> I didn't know there were other. Omas and Opas out there. I just thought it was them. Um, well, one of my favorite things is when we found the film, my husband and I found the film, we realized we finally, we got it. The story he's told, here it is. So I called him very excited, like, we found it, we found it, Opie. And he said, of course you did. I knew you would. <laughs> so my excitement was like, oh, you did? I didn't know I would. Like, <laughs> it was dampened just a little. Right. Oh my gosh. Now, uh, have you optioned the book for a movie? It'd be a fantastic movie. Yeah, not yet. But we're, hey, we're come on out there. You're it's talking coming. to Hollywood here. So right. We're coming next I mean, week. There's a writer strike. I know that. I but, know. It's okay. Uh, come on. We're in the long we're game. Here. It's a long game. Okay. But you know what? These these screenwriters should be reaching out to you uh, because they they've got time on their hands That's right true. now. That's true. Unfortunately, right. and maybe we they, should go. We should go to the picket line and talk oh, to yeah, some let's. and talk to yeah. some. Yeah, because Bring some books. Yeah. It would be a beautiful, fabulous movie again because I think you've you've woven the stories together so magnificently. Really, it's just uh, amazing uh, how you've done such a great uh, job with that. And and Jules, uh, you have a scene in the book where Jules is um, at being honored uh, by some Jewish organization for all of this great work that he did, and um, uh, you know, and again he tells the story of his escape. Yeah, he um, was he was a master of ceremonies. You know, he was if there was a dinner, if it was three people or a hundred people, he'd get up and talk. So. You know, that's why I know all his stories so well. <laughs> Very good. How many grandchildren did he have altogether? Just three. three oh, of them. just three of you. Yep. Wow. My sisters and me. Wow. But, and, but and he was. I, a, but he has great. He had great grandchildren too. My kids. Oh yes. Sister's kid. Oh, very nice. And he was a furrier by trade as well, right? Yeah, most of my family they were all furriers. I see. In, wow. In they they worked together and then they each opened their own stores. One of them moved to Israel and opened a first store there. 
they came to New York and opened them here. That's amazing. Now, um, I'm looking at our questions. Did your mother have, let's see, hold on a second here. I get that back. Whoops. Let me just get the Q&A. Did your mother have any friends in Berlin who were saved by the kinder transport to England? David Goldstein asks. No, David, my mom was only two. She was born in 36, so she came over in 38. So she she didn't really have friends yet, I don't think. Um, mm -hmm. But they, I mean, my grandparents definitely knew people who gave their kids to the kinder transport. It was yeah. an amazing option for children. Sure. So let's let's uh, uh, talk about uh, for a few minutes um, uh, the reception you're getting from the book. First of all, you had a fantastic rave in the New York Times, which just was fabulous to read. And uh, and so, what's the response been from uh, from the community to your book? Well, a lot of people tell us their stories because. <laughs> It's what I mean, I get it. And we have found that every story is phenomenal and yeah. amazing and incredible. I mean, you just it's so dramatic. All of them are adventuresome and incredible. Yeah, we keep telling people to talk to your relatives, your old relatives, you know, go talk to them now because Jules isn't around anymore and I couldn't interview him. We had to get the stories from everybody else in the family. We interviewed everyone in Bonnie's family about Jules. So I got to know him through all those other stories and I, I feel terrible that I didn't meet him. And um, so if you've you've got an uh, Opie or <laughs> an Omi around, you, go, you need to sit down with a tape recorder and talk to them or I guess a phone yeah. now, you don't need a tape recorder. And uh, get those stories down. Yeah, yeah. Don, there's a story. There's my cousin Don, who's in the book. I don't know if you remember. He was on the train pretending to be drunk. Um, I knew him my whole life very well. I never asked. And so yeah. the way we got to hear his story was he did a show a tape where he told us himself in great detail, which was amazing, but it's still better to have that human connection. You know, uh, my wife Susie. Uh, uh, as an only child of these Holocaust survivors, um, my in-laws, and may they rest in peace. And they never told her their stories. It only when I showed up in high school did they start to tell me, a stranger, right. uh, the stories of their um, experiences in um, both Hilda's in Berlin and uh, Abe was a guy from Poland who had uh, escaped uh, the Nazis by going into Russia. And uh, Susie never heard the stories until I came around. So the, the idea of, of, of sharing your family story is really very powerful. And you, in, in doing this book, uh, made a trip to Berlin. You did all kinds of genealogical research and interviews, it's very well documented, your book, which I, I really appreciated as someone who, who loves history as well as a, a great piece of literature, which this book is. There's a thing about, because people didn't speak about it, and then their children were traumatized in a slightly different way, like my mother got the survivor's guilt stuff. 3G, we're called, third generation of survivors are the ones telling the stories, 3G. 3G, yeah, well, it's important. Um, and and we've got a bunch of thank yous in the Q and A. So here's one from Joanne. Wow, pow, huge smiles and heartfelt thanks to Ron, Bonnie, and Helene for this fabulous book and today's fabulous program. Just bought the book on Kindle. Awesome. We'll start reading as soon as the broadcast ends. Awesome. Wish you all the best always. Isn't that nice? Awesome. Well, uh, Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the uh, Maven community, oh, I, I failed to introduce myself. I'm Ron Wolfson. I'm a professor of education <laughs> at American Jewish University. And when Everybody's I was, like, who the hell is that guy? Who's this guy with the uh, <laughs> with my superheroes? This is my our grandchildren used to sleep here. So that's why that's you're great. seeing the princess here. In my <laughs> study. I have to tell you, this book is a page turner. Uh, it really is a page turner. I, I consumed it in uh, two sittings because I couldn't wait to hear it. It's, it's, it's written in, in acts. There's act one and there's act two. Yep. The chapters are punchy and short 
which I appreciated. Keep it moving, the, keep it moving. Keep it moving, exactly. <laughs> and the uh, photos are amazing. The only thing I was missing is the actual film itself. I mean, is it is it available somewhere? Can you see it? There's a little snippet in the New York Times article yeah, there's that Helene 12. wrote in 2017, but yeah, that's it. Where, that's where's it. the film now? Is it in the Smithsonian, Bonnie? Where is it? Maybe one day it's you know in a safety deposit box. <laughs> She's saving it for the movie when we get the the book de the movie deal. She's saving it for that. <laughs> the movie deal. Well, I'll tell you if there are anybody who knows an agent out there, you ought to give these two fabulous authors uh, a ring a dingy because <laughs> it's it's really a terrific terrific book, and I recommend it to everybody. It's called The American Way. A true story of Nazi escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe. And my, I, do you have a final comment? If not, I have one. We just have two you minutes. Left. No, I'm done. Go ahead. You go. Oh uh, well, here's you know this was my conclusion, and it's your conclusion that um, uh, that Jules at that tribute dinner said. Uh, he thanked God and encouraged the crowd to always keep their loved ones alive in their stories. It was only there that they survived. Stories are what bind us together, not just as Jews, but as humans. Stories connect us. If you dug down deep enough, your story was intertwined with every other person's story. It's not just a matter of coincidence. We were all part of a vast network of interconnected narratives. So shouldn't we try and help each other to make the narrative a happy one? Well, this has been a happy 45 minutes. And we thank you, Helene and Bonnie, for really a magnificent uh, story, a magnificent book. And I really encourage everybody to get a copy. You'll love it. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Thanks, everybody, Thank for joining. You. You're awesome. American Jewish University's Maven Platform. We'll see you next time.